which is a newly launched uh, master's program here at CET. Uh, before we begin with the seminar for today, um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Sadakat Mullah to talk a little bit about uh, the EdTech Research Group and our newly launched master's program. Okay. Uh, thanks, Uchita. I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, great. So welcome one and all, uh, uh, especially today's speaker, uh, Pranav and Sangeeta and the team. Uh, so just quickly, uh, the EdTech Research Center, uh, sorry, the EdTech Research Group at the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education, TSS Mumbai, uh, is really a research community that draws on the extensive research and field action work that the center has been doing in the area of education technology. Over the period of uh, uh, about eight to 10 years, the center has really emerged as a, as a leading center of research and field action, uh, not only in India, but also some of the research and innovation has also been taken to other contexts in the global south. The, the research group is a special interest group uh, to nurture a community of researchers who are researching education and technology as well as practicing and converging these knowledges in an academic setup uh, like this. Broadly, the research group looks at, uh, has five focus areas. We do field action projects, uh, our flagship projects of uh, clicks, Delta, and so on, have won multiple awards as well. And we do uh, uh, research, pure research on the education and technology. And we have been teaching education and technology uh, advanced specializations to MA education and BA DEMED. And uh, as we know that we have launched the uh, unique MA in education and technology, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that we have come together today, uh, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about it, but we also create uh, ed tech systems in an academic setup uh, and trying to see how best we can leverage the technologies for educational purposes and research purposes. And so we keep writing because that's what our identity as researchers is. The, uh, the MA in Education and Technology was launched in June 2023. It's a blended online kind of a model that we are uh, trying. It's a one year's a uh, one-year program with options for full-time and part-time uh, really tries to uh, engage with knowledges and pedagogies with the critical considerations of equity, sustainability, um, and ethical considerations to draw upon research and practice uh, in the field. Uh, we have a very... Uh, interesting cohort of people coming from diverse backgrounds who are studying with experts and practitioners uh, in education related courses, ed tech specialization courses. And uh, a unique part of it is also they will create capstone projects uh, for which uh, we really look forward and have been working to work with practitioner spaces, research spaces, wherein these uh, students will be working. And today's uh, uh, seminar is one such opportunity to really engage with the people who are working and researching um, on the field. So we, uh, we are very glad that Pranav is here with lots of experiences. And all of our students are also here, both from the MA at Tech and the MA education who uh, are taking specialization courses in uh, education and technology. So we have uh, Anil, we have uh, Dr. Amina, who is leading the program, and of course, all my colleagues. So uh, really welcome all again. Uh, so look forward to hearing Pranav and others. Thank you.
Um, thank you so much for that really a brief introduction to the EdTech Research Group and MAET. Um, for those who are interested to hear a little more about um, the newly launched Executive Master's Program, uh, we can have a short interaction at the end of the seminar. Uh, for now, I'd like to uh, invite um, Anil to introduce our speaker for today, to those who don't know him. Sure, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second talk of our EdTech Talk se uh, seminar series. Uh, today's talk is on research-based evaluation of learning in EdTech uh, by Pranav Kothari. While I was uh, at Tata Classic, um, we had some brief interactions with Sridhar Rajagopalan, who is a co-founder of the Edu Educational Initiative Group, to the around 2014-15. Um, that time itself, I knew it was one of those EdTech organizations uh, which is very keen to make an impact on underserved schools. Uh, that was also around the time I connected with Pranav on LinkedIn. Uh, Pranav Kuthari is the, is the CEO of Education Initiatives. He has been with EI for over a decade and has made uh, significant contributions to the company through his involvement in EI MindSpark as the head of HR, gifted student education, and EI Shiksha. EI MindSpark is a personalized um, and adaptive learning solution. And under Pranav's leadership, it has been deployed and recognized as the only software-based edtech tool that has demonstrated a significant learning impact as independently measured by third parties like JPAL. Pranav is a thought leader in the industry and has led teams that scaled high quality student assessments, personalized adaptive learning, and impact evaluation services for governments, CSF founders, and philanthropic foundations. Pranav is also a TEDx speaker and Inc, in, an Inc fellow and was named by the third and, and was named by the World Economic Forum's Schwab Foundation as the Corporate Social Entrepreneur of the Year in 2019. He studied mechanical engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology and earned his MBA from the Harvard Business School. Before joining EI, Pranav worked at GTI Capital and Boston Consulting Group in five countries. Welcome, Pranav, to our seminar series. Along with Pranav, we also have Sankita as a co presenter. Sankita Oak is a director, interactives and games at EI. She's passionate about using technology to improve uh, children's learning. She's currently exploring new technology initiatives in EI using AR, VR, and generative AI. Um, welcome, Sankita. Uh, so, and over to you, Pranav. Great. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. And uh, in advance, uh, happy Onam uh, to everybody who's uh, celebrating it. Uh, we had a little bit in the office, um, so I'm still uh, savoring the payasam. I just finished uh, a little while ago. Um, uh, this is a, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think this field itself of, uh, you know, ed tech or education and technology is uh, something I, I'm, I'm so happy that there's a master's course on this, uh, you know, but uh, when Anil and I were working uh, at tech itself, we had to explain to our parents what we do. Um, so it's, it's great to see uh, so much traction on this. Um, you know, I think in today's session, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of our um, experience on the pedagogy side of you know what we discovered through our assessments um, show you some photos of how technology is making uh, this more equitable uh, for all students both uh, in India but also some of our work in South Africa where we're catering to the bottom of the pyramid um, and some of the partnerships we've embarked on with researchers uh, many of whom who have uh, come and done an independent third party external evaluation of our work on the ground. So they were self-funded, they have done both randomized control trials, uh, as well as other forms of study to sort of really see, uh, is uh, EdTech improving learning outcomes in literacy and numeracy for students or not? Um, uh, this is meant to be interactive. It's not, it's a nice small group. Uh, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat window. Uh, between Sangeeta and me, we'll either try to respond over text or um, voice uh, on those. And then there's also some time left uh, towards the end for more questions. Um, just a, a quick check that my screen is visible. Um, so, you know, I... I I, I, you know, I was asking uh, all of uh, when we are in college, right? So you are in college, and, and if I were to ask you why are you here, uh, and and you should try to answer this question uh, of why are you here? Why are you listening to this talk? Why are you at this? Why are you pursuing an 
I mean, it tech, but, you know, Mark Twain, I think, um, said something that resonates with me, which is, you know, without dreams and goals, uh, there is no living, only merely existing. And at least that is not why we are here. <laughs> Uh, but why I am still here and still interested and still doing this um, uh, is this concept of Ikigai, right? I think it took me some while. It took me a lot of um, hits and misses and uh, falling and trying and persisting. But uh, I, I feel like that, you know, if each of us can find something that we love, we are good at, uh, that we can get paid for uh, so that it's sustainable. We can do this for a long time. It's not just a one or two year fellowship, but it's a decade or two. And Anil has sort of, you know, probably on his third decade now. Uh, and what also the world needs, right? I said the intersection of these, I think this concept itself resonates uh, a lot with me. And I feel improving learning at scale is an important and interesting problem, right? Um, it is what the world needs and um, uh, uh, it's interesting as well, right? So that's uh, what's in it for me. And I feel in the India we have grown up in and what we are seeing, I think many aspects have been dramatically transformed, right? We just managed to be the first country to land uh, on the south pole of the moon. Uh, our airports are getting better. We're making a new kilometer of of highway every day we are uh, the most advanced uh, and and the most affordable uh, cell phone uh, rates uh, and coverage um, so there are so many aspects that have been dramatically transformed but not education right uh, education still seems to be um, sort of uh, pretty poor and over a 30 40 year study also education in india has not improved uh, and that's sad. Uh, we know this because we have done numerous studies for the last 23 years uh, at EI. Pratham and Asar has done this. Uh, India has participated in international tests. Um, but our students are not able to do very basic uh, reading and writing and arithmetic. And this is not just in government schools, uh, and this data is from our studies in government schools, but also we assess uh, students from the top 2000 private schools across India. And we find that uh, children there are able to recall definitions, um, and, and I'm guilty of it, and probably many of us have had to do it to score more marks, but we are, the students are not able to really understand the concept underneath it, right? So you ask them for the definition of density, they can they can rat it out uh, if you ask them like what would this ice look like uh, many many students struggle with and again there's multiple studies but we were second last in the world as measured on the pisa test so what i what is this big interesting and important problem that you know we are willing to dedicate next 10 20 years of our lives which is that the education system today and along with the boom in edtech uh, that has happened in the recent three or four years has actually failed to solve the fundamental problem of learning, right? So if you look at it in the school system, uh, there are 20, 30, 40 in, in some government urban schools, 100 students in a classroom and, and the teacher is just not going to be able to give personalized attention. Uh, even the students who manage to get after school learning, there's a disconnect between what the school teacher does and the tuition teacher does, right? and they never talk to each other. The child is getting two parallel tracks. Um, everywhere, there is this uh, emphasis on drill, on doing more worksheets and solving past papers and solving thousands of problems, which is just creating more rote um, even the B2C that has emerged uh, so far uh, has been expensive where people are taking loans and uh, it's also viewed as an add-on, right? It's not integrated. So I think a good form of ed tech would be something that personalizes the learning. It identifies and remediates the misconceptions students have, and this does it at a highly affordable price so that all students, regardless of their parental income, can sort of get access to it. So this is the, you know, as... Each of you who's a master's in education and technology student uh, about to embark in the world, um, you know, in terms of a framework, no matter where you work, uh, what you join, what you start, uh, these are some problems that would be worthwhile for you to solve. Um, and it, it, I'm, I'm glad this course is called education and technology, right? Um, and I was, I was thinking about how they are 
um how, what do those was and I, I think interweaving is the word that sort of came to me so so when i think of technology you know uh, in the education sector i think it can deliver at scale uh, it can provide good quality uh, there's no transmission loss right so if you do teacher training the first set of teachers you do they do a certain way if they have to go out and do a cascade training then that's sort of inferior and all the way down like if you look at the last mile there is a transmission loss, but technology can actually help to do this without that. Um, I see the role of technology as empowering teachers, right? Not replacing them. I, I see technology as something that helps a teacher achieve his or her intent. Um, and of course, there's a whole bunch of choices on hardware, software, internet, uh, and things that we have grappled with as we have tried to bring this to the, uh, you know, both the urban elite of Mumbai, Dubai, but also so the last mile in a Dantewada and a Pumalanga, um, in terms of how do we navigate uh, something that we take for granted in cities is not there. So that's the tech side of things. But I think what is underrated and not talked about enough is the education or the pedagogy part of it, right? Um, so far the word at tech almost seems to imply technology for education in education. But what about the core education, the pedagogy side of it? And there, that's where... We have spent the last two years really thinking about what is a good question, right? Um, how do we collect large scale data so it's representative? Uh, so we capture the long tail of that. Uh, how do we find uh, insights uh, from the misconceptions students have? Um, as a, as a pedagogy, we all understand that learning at the right level is going to help, right? Where you meet the student where they are. So it's neither too difficult nor too easy. Like, I mean, remember the time in the classroom, apne ko lagta hai, bouncer ja hai, or we're bored because, you know, we've learned it before. How do you get it just right? How do you get it like in the zone of proximal development at the intersection of what they know and don't know? And how do we make this active, right? We've all seen pictures of students listening to uh, teachers via satellite TV. Uh, uh, and that's very passive. Like, how can that be more active? And so this course of master's in education technology should sort of emphasize both the education, the pedagogy side and technology and sort of get there. And that's, and they will reinforce each other. One will simply help the other. So, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm taking the liberty of uh, testing you, um, uh, given that you have reached uh, a master's degree. Um, these are uh, uh, si si seemingly simple questions. Uh, um, from the lens of students. So on the chat window, you know, if you can tell me, uh, so the, the, this is a pencil, there's a ruler, the length of the pencil is five centimeters, I've highlighted that in green. But in the chat window, if you can sort of tell me what would grade four students uh, answer, right? Um, and what choice would they pick and why? And mind you that this concept of length is covered in grade two. Uh, in, in all curriculums. So by grade two, they should have mastered length. So if you're on the chat window, you can type in, what do you think 11 year old students um, uh, picked when they got this answer? Um, if you've picked a number, if you can also explain why, like, so Anusha, Shalaja, Anu, thank you for typing in, but please, if you can also tell me why did they pick what they picked? So as you think about it, and you can also tell me how many students got it right, like what percentage got it right, and what percentage pick six. So, so, so type away. Um, and when we've done this study, you know, over a very, very, very large sample set, we found that only eleven percent got it right, right. Um, more than sort of three quarters of the students uh, got it. Uh, uh, so, okay, so in the next time, we asked variations of this uh, question, right? So the same pencil, same ruler, uh, same five centimeters is the right answer. Uh, but as you can see, the pencil is a bit offset. So what would they have sort of answered here now in this question? So Anusha says previously it was six because, you know, pencil is ending there. Now, it'll be five, uh, Anusha, I'm assuming you, you, you feel that the offset has sort of made it more obvious. Um, uh, anu, please tell a little bit about why it's difficult for the child. Um, Alia, so let's say if they would count, uh, after counting, what answer would they give? Um, 
And, and so we did this also with a very large sample set. And we found that the majority of the students uh, who got it wrong answered six. And we were very surprised, right? We could have understood four. We could have understood nine. Uh, of course, five is the right answer. Uh, but getting six back was very puzzling for us. Um, and uh, we, could, we couldn't decipher it on our own. So what we did is we went and talked to the students and asked them to explain the answer. And so this is a recording of the you know, students sort of explaining their answer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you counted that and that's why you said that it's yeah. eight. Yeah. And uh, not because this point is eight? No. This four will count as one. And then nine will be six. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't see how much it, uh, there is. Start from six because it starts from four, four, one, 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 two, three, four, five, six. This for this is one centimeter. Yeah. And this for this? That is zero centimeter. This is zero centimeter. How much is this, uh, this to this? Two centimeters. Okay, so this much is two centimeters? No, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and how much is this? Five centimeters. Same is yet, and the answer is six because it's starting from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. This time the ending point is here. So thanks, I, you know, I think Bindu, uh, Sohini, um, you know, Shweta, Prachi, uh, uh, many of you sort of got uh, it correct, right, in terms of sort of counting. Uh, uh, Varya, many of you sort of understood that they were counting. But if you look at it, like that they were counting confidently, right? It's not a silly mistake. And you can also figure out that these are children from some of the top private Indian schools. So it's not just a government school problem as well. Um, uh, and so when we got this insight that they are counting, we actually built something into the EdTech product, the MindSpark product. And what we sort of, you know, wanted to, without using the words length and count and all of those, we had this frog that starts jumping from two, uh, asking how many times did the frog jump to be able to establish that the length is the distance between sort of two points and not just the number of ticks that they were essentially counting. And then we presented this back to all the teachers, right? In terms of this one page sheet, we said, this is a question we asked. We even explained why we are made this question. What did the students answer? What were the insights we got from this? And how can you as a teacher do this in the classroom without technology, right? How could you sort of do this? So literally asking a question, collecting large scale data, drawing pedagogic insights, you know, building something in ed tech and building something for non-tech to be able to do it. So we've built these 200 such you know, misconception posters. What you can see here is students tell us that uh, A is a triangle, B is a triangle, because if you put it upside down, it becomes a triangle, C is a triangle, but they can also, only a quarter of the students get it right. Um, the others actually explain to you why D is not a triangle. And, and all of this is in the public domain. It's donated to Diksha. You know, if you are thinking of being an ed tech entrepreneur, I would encourage you to look at all of this. This could be a good roadmap for you to start your ed tech company, to solve the big and important meaningful problem of improving learning, right? This is the pedagogy. This is the ed uh, uh, on which your tech uh, could be built. Um, and I think, you know, the good questions are very underrated, right? But they can really distinguish uh, learning uh, as opposed to memorizing, right? They can really give you insights uh, into what students um, think about um, so let's sort of see some more examples, right? So when you ask the question on the left, um, vast majority of the students get it right. Um, again, on the chat window, uh, what do you think students uh, pick uh, for the question on the right? And, you know, what percentage of the students uh, uh, get it right? Um, so these are three shapes. We ask, we don't ask for the number. We're just asking which of these have a perimeter. Uh, and we find that only 40% get it right, right? Um, so a lot of students think that shape two cannot have a perimeter because they don't know the formula for it. Um, sometimes students think that shape three 
can have a perimeter because they know the perimeter of a squares formula, right? So, so students have this. Like this one's actually pretty interesting, and you can try it um, um, uh, in your in your own uh, sort of classes, or, or or even with adults or friends or you know nephews and uh, nieces. So there's a piece of paper, right, which is Q, uh, and and you take another piece of paper, identical in every way, but you just crumple it uh, so it looks like P. Um, I, I'm revealing to you that P and Q have the same weight. Uh, when we asked this to students, only a quarter of the students got it uh, right, right? And when we asked the other students uh, who said that uh, P is actually heavier, we asked them why. This is what they had to say. You have more mass because when the sheet P is not crushed, the mass gets lesser. The mass gets smaller. Yeah. How do you know that? I think because his size was reduced. If a paper is crumpled, uh, the density is, density is more than a, a paper which is not crumpled. Uh, so because of crumpling, uh, there may be some air in, in between of the crumples in paper P and it may become heavier. And when we drop it, it uh, because of the heaviness, it may not react to the air and the paper uh, Q, it has no air stored in it. So it will it will uh, fall float, uh, floating in the air. You see, when we crumple the paper, air gets trapped. Some air may be trapped inside. And that increases what? Uh, weight. So, you know, the point of all of this is that uh, pedagogy, right, underneath the technology can really provide the lift. Uh, so, so switching gears, you know, this is a photo I took in 2012. Uh, you know, Gaurav was one of the students who came to uh, these Mindsfuck centers that I was running in uh, urban slums of Delhi. And uh, I, I still remember this experience because this child had never touched any form of digital device before. And, and I had to literally hold his hand and get him to double click. And that literally sent an electric shock in my body because it was also very early in my career as I was dealing with uh, students. And, and so, so what we sort of then sort of, these were the types of centers, right? So this is a photo, uh, uh, it's a 600 square foot basement. Uh, in this particular case, we are holding a parent meeting. Uh, we're explaining to them what their students would be doing on the computers, not playing games, but actually learning Hindi, uh, Ganit, uh, and, and also English as a second language. Um, uh, Kajal here happened to be, you know, in the center of the fort, happened to be a very bright student, uh, but she was rare, right? She was amongst one out of less than 1,000 students who was at grade level. Every other child was sort of below grade level. And so the software would adapt to their current uh, knowledge. We also found that there is this huge aspiration to learn English, but pedagogically mother tongue language can be supportive. So we actually uh, built in the software a split screen approach. What you can see on the left is that the choice of a child, they can just click a button. The same question appears uh, on the left in Hindi and on the right in English. Um, we have, we, this is a photo from you know a village in Churu district of Rajasthan, uh, very hot, very dusty. Um, uh, and devices can be very fragile. And so we found ways to protect the most expensive part of the Chromebook uh, and then just attached keyboard and mouse so that they can be replaced uh, at a lower cost but while still maintaining functionality. Um, this is a photo from inside Pota Cabin Schools in Dantewada. Uh, if, if you just Google Mindsfuck in Dantewada, it's a seven minute clip. It's in the middle of an axle area. Um, there is absolutely no internet connectivity. In fact, they literally put the server in the back of a van, drive for 11 kilometers to the highway, synchronize it once a fortnight and bring it back. But the child's experience on the learning is unmatched. And right? there are 20 such schools doing it. And so they have this competition on who can sort of learn the most. Um, in Himachal, we found that the government had put 10 computers, um, uh, but you know we were only working on one is to one uh, personalized learning before, but we sort of came to the conclusion that in an under-resourced country, um, we should pair up students. So now we had the full class of 20 come in here, and two students who were closest in learning levels were sort of paired up um, so that they could learn. Um, COVID taught us many new things in terms of how do we make this available through apps uh, or not through apps sometimes because apps uh, consume space. And so sometimes, you know, our uh, uh, our students wanted it just to be a browser, which does not uh, take up storage. Um, 
and, and in very, very, very different settings, we sort of enable this to happen. And we also build this now in 10 Indian languages. So, um, you know, we found that, the, of course, English is important and it's an upward mobile and there's an English as a second language subject. But it's very important that the child's language of comfort uh, is also sort of catered to. So, so we are providing this in 10 Indian languages, uh, uh, both to read and to do maths in those language. And this can take different forms on laptops, desktops, uh, tablets come in. Um, you know, a lot of government schools, uh, if you do a surprise walk-in, you may not find the teacher. And I find natural student leadership sort of emerges where students help out each other so that learning Nobody should be a gatekeeper to a child's learning, you know, and, and that's quite powerful. Of course, when we did the Himachal pairing, we also found students would discuss with each other and explain to each other. And a fair bit of peer learning sort of comes in. Otherwise, EdTech is associated with a lot of, let's say, um, you know, one student on a computer can be lonely. Uh, so those are some interesting uh, experiments that uh, uh, I take up. So it's been a rewarding journey, you know, as any of you who is embarking on this. I think these are the, these are my battery charges. This is why after 12 years, I still uh, wake up and come to the office because every time I go on the field, um, it sort of energizes me. It allows me to renew my vows as to why what I'm doing is uh, really important. So, you know, so far we've spoken about education. We've spoken about technology. We've spoken about how pet tech, ed tech sort of comes together. Uh, and one, uh, uh, you know, very important uh, partnership in this um, has been the research component with the researchers, right? And a lot of researchers have wanted to know what has been the impact of learning uh, of all these photos, right? I mean, they're nice to look at, uh, they're heartwarming, but uh, have you really moved the needle on someone's literacy numeracy? Uh, and so we've been very open. We've actually allowed every researcher to come in and uh, analyze it. And it's been scary. I mean, to be frank, like the first time this was happening, I wasn't sure if we would do well or not. But the researcher told me, Pranav, I'm guaranteeing you that this will be published. So if you if this comes out badly, the world will know that MindSuck makes no impact on learning. Uh, but if it comes out well, that's also what we will talk about. So so it is scary, but I think the more we were vulnerable and opened it up, the more we learned from it um, and improved. So just a quick primer on, you know, RCTs, right? Um, the, the medical industry has used this uh, to uh, get formal approval for drugs, but essentially you have a, a list of, in our case, students um, uh, or schools, um, they get randomized. So some schools uh, get into the treatment group, they get the MindSpark software, some schools don't. Uh, and these treatment and control group are identical, right? Because I was indifferent between which would go into which. So the RCTs we've participated in, whether it's students sometimes, um, like the first Delhi study was randomized at the student level. The second study in Rajasthan was randomized at the school level. Um, so you put them into two groups. Now, of course, every child is unique and every school is unique. But at the group level, the treatment group and control group are equivalent in terms of any parameters that you want to look at. And then one of them gets mind spark, one of them doesn't. And then you sort of see at the end of it how much learning has happened, right? So this is what a classical RCT is. And we've been part of a uh, few of them. Uh, um, and broadly, what we've found is children are learning about somewhere between two times, three times to five times, depending on what study. There are a lot of nuances here, right? So what you see on the left is the first JPAL study from the uh, mind spark center which I showed you photos from the Delhi where they found that children were learning about two to three times more um, in maths and language. Uh, but the middle graph is, you know, what's um, very promising about that tech because what it tells you is that regardless of whether you were a very bright student, an average student, or a bottom one third, the learning that you got from it uh, is actually significantly more than the control group, right? So if you look at this blue bar here, that's the bottom one third group, they are learning virtually nothing in the school, right? They're very close to the zero bar. And, and we can imagine that, right? The bottom one third of the class is simply just lost and is just going through the motion. See, the bottom one third actually learned as much as the top one third without uh, ed tech. And of course, the top one third learned even more. So what you can see is that regardless of whether you are a very bright kid or a very dull, kid needing support, everyone learned substantially more um, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a high quality ed tech software 
than without. And that's the promise of edtechs. If you do remedial classes, they tend to favor the bottom one. If you do business as usual, the teachers tend to focus on the first two uh, rows. But but a high quality edtech that's adaptive can actually help all students, right? So we've been part of five, five different external evaluations done by researchers and uh, uh, it has an interest. And, and one of the reasons uh, why adaptive, so when, if you are starting your own edtech or any company you join, make sure that the edtech program is adapting to the child's level, right? This is um, what Karthik sort of, uh, who's the head of JPL Education, says the most important graph that he has on, which is on the x-axis, you have the school grade level, right? So students go to standard one, standard two, standard eight. Y-axis is the equivalent real level, right? Um, so, of course, we want to be on the uh, blue line, the 45 degree line, which is every child, like, you know, let's say this number here, uh, when they are in standard eight in school, they are also uh, uh, of standard eight ability level. But you can see all these dots are basically students, right? They represent students. So at eight standard, there are very, very few students, less than 10% of the students are at grade level. But students are not just at lower levels, they're at different levels. So if you and I walked into a, eighth grade classroom, we would find students who are struggling with letters, who are the equivalent of grade two, grade four, grade five, six, seven, eight. And the red line is the average of these dots, right? So the average eighth grader is at the fourth grade level. Uh, the average sixth grader is at the grade three level and so on and so forth. So even the world's best teacher would sort of really struggle as to who do you teach, right? Do you focus on the bright kids because your bosses have told you to finish the eighth standard curriculum? Do you focus on the weak kids because they are the farthest from that um, and that's where you know technology can help so what this graph is is it's actually taken from one random single day you know it happens to be third november now all those eighth grade students we saw on the previous graph you can see that they are uh, actual ability level is between two three four five six seven right very few at eight so this bottom quadrant here is grade eight students in school they're all whatever, 14 years old, they're grade eight. Their ability level is two to six. But on a random day, they are getting content that is, you know, uh, between like plus or minus uh, of their grade level, right? So if you look at this extraordinarily hyper customization, um, it's borderline humanly impossible to do, right? Um, and so technology can be a great enabler for a teacher. Like, I mean, I, I say that Mindswork is like a, digital assistant, right? Every child, every teacher should get 40 digital assistants who sort of cater to every child and report back to the main teacher in terms of what the gaps are and what their role could be. Um, again, continuing from this RCT and continuing from this partnerships with, you know, JPAL, ID Insight, uh, Gray Matters, all of who have found, one uh, thing that encouraged me a lot is that there is a linear dose response curve, which means that the more children use, the more their gains are, right? So you heard the x-axis is um, going from zero to 50 and, and, you know, 50 hours a year is already a lot. So the study essentially um, uh, uh, maxed out at that uh, when they were doing this for four months. And the y-axis is um, gain in SD, right? So largely a measure of how much they learn. So what you see is this extraordinary... Uh, 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 encouraging fact that you know, as long as they're using it, they will sort of learn more. The second thing um, that the study found, which I think is very important, is that all students are learning, right? Whether they are the brightest or they need support, like what you can see is the red line and the blue line, is it's, a, it's an offset uh, 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 for, for all percentiles of the student going from zero to 100. The third thing they found is that the daily habit is important, right? So instead of you sitting one day and doing two hours versus you doing half an hour every day for four days, uh, the latter is much better. Uh, and, and you can think about this from other habits like going to the gym or, or, or brushing, right? So they found that that sort of had a good uh, impact. And so, you know, my personal journey in terms of learning from all these research um, has been, it, it really provided me the encouragement to stay the course. You know, I remember the day the RCT results came out, I had I, I had failed at uh, fundraising and had to close the centers down, but the study then like helped me to revive that back um, because I had now evidence of the work we had done. It, 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 the research has uh, also provided a good mirror, right? So they, they told me that Mindswork for grade, lower grades uh, needed far more work 
um, and, and in higher grades as well. This. So, so I started making content for grades one, two, which wasn't there before. We had to make changes in the operational model, like we saw the Himachal uh, project, because we simply couldn't do one is to one computer. Um, uh, and finally, like, you know, what uh, content works, what doesn't. Um, so, so that's sort of then my content name. So for example, I have Sangeeta here today with me. Um, she is going to show us like how, when we got to know that uh, children are struggling with, um, you know, different phases of the moon, um, we actually built something uh, in MindSpark so that they can visualize this better. Uh, as we were preparing for this course, uh, we were obviously very proud of uh, Chandrayaan um, landing. And so, so this, um, you know, so this is for you, just a sense of how do we go from what we found in research to how do we build content. Sangeeta, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Pranav. And uh, listening to everything you said, parents are all over again. And definitely a motivation for me every day as well. Um, so, Gita, we, you may need to be louder with me. Just, just probably come closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah, this is better. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, I was just saying that for me, uh, though, you know, I come from a tech background, uh, really, my passion is how do we use technology to make an impact at scale, uh, especially now with solutions from generative AI that we're exploring, uh, really making an impact, uh, you know, in personalized teaching, personalized tutoring. So uh, since we've just had Chandrayaan 3, I thought, uh, you know, this uh, interactive that we have would be an interesting one to share with you all. Uh, so one of the, we're constantly looking at misconceptions, right? I mean, that is one of the strengths of AI, that we're looking at where are the misconceptions and how can we remediate them, whether it is assessment or whether it is uh, learning tools. So the interactives that we build for MindSpark, so one of the topics, which is uh, phases of the moon, uh, often, I mean, we have found various reasons for the misconceptions, the most common being that uh, the phases are caused by shadows. Uh, uh, another one, interesting one is that they're caused by clouds. Uh, so we have all kinds of misconceptions. And uh, so this is an interactive that we have built where the, I mean, when, when you go into space or any spatial object, you know, the teaching of it becomes that much more challenging. So one of the interesting things with this interactive is that you're actually allowing the child to interact with it so the name is very appropriate. And uh, this also allows the child to, we can even go back in time. So if you want to check what is the, uh, what was the phase of the moon in say the 19th century, you can enter the date and you can enter the city and you can check that. So, uh, and there are so many other things that we've found uh, that carry on in our adulthood as well. And we don't know those that those were misconceptions. Um, so for example, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but we always see only one side of the moon ever. We never see the other side at all. And it is very counterintuitive because if you look at it, it is actually a revolving and a rotating body. So you would think that I'm always going to see some part, some full part of the moon at some point when it goes around me on earth. But that just never happens. And I don't know if uh, any of you are aware of this, this came about when we were researching for, you know, building the phases of the moon tool uh, that because the speed of the revolution and the speed of the rotation is the same, uh, by the time the moon completes one rotation, it has also completed a revolution around the earth, which is why you never see the other side at all. Uh, so which is, which is so interesting. And so there are so many different learnings. So for example, one of the questions that we have in mind spark for this uh, you have you're in Bangalore, you have a friend in Paris. On a given day, would you and your friend see the same phase of the moon? So, you know, those kinds of questions that the tool will allow the child to explore and understand better. So, so this is where I see, you know, my role in really using technology to enable interesting learning and giving those aha moments. I mean, when I find something like this, I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know this. And this is so interesting. Uh, so I really look to have those 
aha moments when the child's eyes light up and um, this is how i'm looking at using technology we have built many such interesting other pieces um but i think i'd let yeah sure. um so yeah just in terms of uh, this so what you see here is a spaceship right uh, on the left um and so as you sort of navigate it, uh, this uh, part out, you can see the spaceship on the left um, moving and seeing the moon from or capturing the moon uh, from different sides. So that's sort of how we see. And, and so if you just uh, um, keep like when we see like, uh, you know, going from Amavas to a, uh, uh, to a Poonam, right? So this is uh, what we actually this is what's actually happening. Like where it's only this one, this other part of the moon is like, that's why China has the credit of being landing on the other side. We have the credit for being on the south side. But all of us have only seen this half of the moon when we see it going from uh, Amavas to Pudam and, and back, right? Like this is all that we see. But at least I didn't know that. I learned this only today as I was preparing for this. Super. So we'll, um, you know, just pause here. Uh, it's about 40, 40 minutes Um and we're happy to take questions. Um, um, uh, Anil and Sadakat, hopefully you can um, guide us uh, if, if this was helpful. Uh, and and uh, yeah, happy to take questions and, and answer. Very helpful, Kenneth. Yeah. Uh, you could. Uh... The audience, uh, you could either put your questions uh, in the chat box or uh, unmute yourself and ask it. Yes. Uh, I see Bindu's hand up, so Bindu, you can. Bindu, go, yeah, go ahead, Bindu. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was really nice. Um, I had just two questions. One of the questions was, uh, you said you looked at the learning gains after using the, uh, um, the EdTech tool, the MindSpark tool. Um, how did you measure those learning gains? Uh, what, what? Were there again multiple choice questions that were posed to students? Um, that was my first question. And my second question is, um, um, I mean, it's not a question. I, I just wonder uh, in these RCT uh, tests, um, uh, how you um, uh, reconcile with the fact that you you provide a, a learning opportunity for one set of children and you have to not provide a learning opportunity for another set of children. Uh, yeah. You know, th those two questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks for answering, asking Bindu. So Bindu, on the, you know, on the second question on, let's say the ethical dilemmas that you face. See, um, there are two ways to look at this. One is the resources to do an intervention are always a fraction of the available population, right? So let's say we were able to raise enough money to do the intervention in 50 schools. India has 1.5 million schools. We have, nobody is going to be able to raise money to cover all 1.5 million schools. So you anyways have to select. So what we do is you select 100 schools, each of which could get it. And then you run a randomization, like a coin toss, and some get it, some don't. But it's not like you denied someone when you could have given. You only had money for 50. So there is no ethical dilemma from that perspective because there wasn't enough money to provide to all. So that's part one. Part two is where possible, you can flip it. So after the first, let's say, two years of providing it into one group, the other acts as a control. And after two years, you can sort of flip it where the control gets it for two years and the intervention becomes control. So that's the other way to sort of balance out uh, our cities uh, to do this. Mm, your first question was around uh, how were the gains measured? So 
again, because you want this to be an independent third party neutral thing, EI was completely excluded from the process because we were doing the intervention. So JPAL built the instruments, uh, conducted the test with their own things. In fact, they would do surprise visits. They are not accountable to us. They don't have to tell us when they come, when they go, what they do, what they don't. Um, what they sort of did was they, for grades one and two, it was a one-on-one -on -one, uh, test uh, orally because children are too young to write a written test. Um, so they had uh, field investigators who would, um, um, you know, do uh, with one student, one investigator would sort of spend time and measure their literacy numeracy. And the process is identical in both schools, right? Uh, the test has to be done regardless of whether it's an intervention and control. Uh, for older grades, they would take written tests um, on paper and pencil. So there is no handicap to technology because obviously the control group doesn't have that uh, and the test has to be uniform. So the measuring scale is the same. Um, uh, and and uh, the, you know, the way the test is conducted is appropriate to sort of global standards of measuring literacy numeracy um, uh, as as well as uh, sort of a mixture of a variety of questions that are MCQ open-ended and long form uh, because they are able to grade out uh, the students after the pre-post. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I uh, have a question from Pooja on chat uh, that I'll answer. When building an ed tech, what should you optimize on after initial growth, impact or profitability? When investment uh what gave you the courage mm. okay um so puja has given me extra 40 minutes to speak now um uh so so puja i think um yeah there are many times in life where you have an orthogonal choice um but between impact and profitability i don't think it's there right so for example, uh, we serve both the top end of the pyramid. So some of the best schools in the country use it um, and pay us a per child per year annuity fee. And we also serve bottom of the pyramid where we still raise philanthropy money from, let's say, USAID, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble, CSR, Amazon. Um, so to run this sustainably, we are sort of raising philanthropy. Of course, we're not charging the students and the parents in the government school setup, but a combination of government and philanthropy uh, makes sure that the ends meet, right? So so to do your first question on, <clears throat> you know, growth, profitability, they are intertwined. Like if, if you don't deliver learning outcomes, nobody will pay you. My ability to raise, fundraise goes up dramatically when I have the evidence that it makes the impact on learning. And for me to make the evidence on impact on learning, I need to make sure my product, technology, content, research is sort of top notch, which needs money, right? So it's a bit of a virtuous loop if you can get in and it's, uh, 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 you can't separate the two, they are very intertwined. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, uh, the courage or foolishness to sign up for an RCT for the first time, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, also came from a desire to sort of get better and to sort of know. I mean, we all drink our Kool-Aid so much, right? I always think like what I do is the best in the world. So so for you to be grounded, for you to really get a third party view, it's important that you sign up for something from the outside uh, to be able to do this. Uh, and of course, by the time the RCT rolled around, I had about two to three years of experience of running it on the ground. So I had a bit of an intuition that, yes, I, I'd seen enough case studies, like the god of where, who I had to help with the mouse was uh, doing division, you know, by the end of uh, grade, by the end of the second year of intervention. So, so there was this inner intuition, there was a desire to sort of get better, there was a, 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 a uh, and, and you know, funny enough, we are an assessments organization. So if we don't get assessed by others, that would be pretty uh, um, <clears throat> uh, satirical on our part. Uh, so that's uh, another perspective. Uh, I think market in India, matlab, <laughs> there is so much already published on this. Maybe you can ask me a more specific question and I can try to uh, help answer that. Um, let me take Anusha's. Sorry. Yeah, Anil, you said something? Uh, no. Anusha's chat was there. So there was Anu and Rachana who also oh, raised yeah, their yeah. hands. Yeah, yeah. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, Anil, would you like to moderate? Maybe you can pick uh, uh, so that. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and uh, answer Anusha's uh, question and then we'll go to Anu. Okay. So, we'll do Anusha, Anu, Archana, and then Bindu in that uh, order. Um, <clears throat> Sangeeta, feel free to jump in whenever you want to. Uh, Pranav wanted to know a tech readiness for children, low device to students. Um, <clears throat> so the, the split is a wonderful device, Anusha. It doesn't reduce anything. Both, both of them are wearing headphones. Both of us get both of them get the same volume, the same clarity. It's literally a two for one. It's a really it, it costs like a few rupees. Um, and so obviously we we bought twice the number of headphones. But uh, you know the splitter is a wonderful thing. N nothing reduces. Oh, uh... The reason I'm asking Pranav is because uh, we have used the splitter in clicks mm. and we found that the moment you try and create a daisy chain, so if there are two students to one device, yes, it is wonderful. But yeah. if you want to use another splitter to try and take a third student or a fourth student in, yeah. was there that kind of a challenge? Because with Hindi, I'm assuming there would be a lot of audio yeah. input yeah. that you would have given. No, we didn't do beyond two is to one. Um, see, which is why, okay, so this is a good point. Like, the, you need enabling conditions to do ed tech, right? If you tell me, go to this remotest part of Darjeeling, I mean, okay, today we are doing in some extraordinary remote places, but you know, you do need electricity for at least eight hours a day to charge the devices, right? You do need, like, although the students don't need internet, you do need internet periodically to get operational data and to sort of know whether your usage is happening or not you do need um, a minimum number of devices. Like if I go to a school with 300 students and it has four computers, there's nothing really meaningful that I can do there. So there is a set of minimum enabling conditions before you can do it tech. And the, my point is as follows, right? When the first mobile phone came out, we didn't say how can the, the farmer in like Bareilly uh, use the and afford this. We just started it. The phones got better, the costs got cheaper. And today the farmer in Bareilly is using it. Similarly for tech. Even in the top 1% of India, is there evidence of edtech improving learning outcomes? And the evidence is mixed. Uh, so unless we start on that journey, unless we do more of that, uh, India, as India progresses, 4G will get better, roads will get better, things will get cheaper, you know, computers, everything will get better. So by the time we reach the, you know, uh, the Mizoram uh, girl who needs edtech, we know what we should give her like as opposed to just uh, hardware and software. So that's the thought on, um, you know, minimum enabling conditions, starting where you can, constantly refining, iterating uh, on this. I mean, today, like after 13 years, we have been able to manage to put this on a Raspberry Pi device, which fits in the palm of your hand. It can use a, a mobile phone battery pack of 10,000 mAh. It can support 10 students to learn without electricity, without internet for five hours. Uh, but that's, like your 13th of our sort of iterative work uh, uh, on this so so that's uh you know we just have to start and you keep tinkering okay anu uh what's your question hi um it was a nice talk where first time i think uh, i heard some interesting research on pedagogy has uh, gone into. Um, what I would like to know is uh, whether um, you have done this for a complete module, like I have seen few concepts being explored. I think I did not get an understanding of um, the grade of the student. For example, um, we have to revisit concepts in different grades. It is not something that we do partial, uh, rather you need to revisit. Um, and we also need to ensure there is a, a meaningful understanding happened. If you are taking any scientific concepts, since you took examples of maths and science, if it is energy or if it is matter, force, light, it, we may need to ensure a complete understanding for the child. So I would like to know whether something like that has been done, um, um, which are the grades, and also, since you used sort of proximal development, uh, it is something that you do uh, for an individual child in a very unique manner. Children bring unique potential to the classroom, unique social background to the classroom. To the classroom. I think um, it is uh, like 
hearts being uh, taken into account, uh, the kind of uh, unique abilities uh, that the child is bringing uh, to the classroom and how you assess that and then scaffold learning. Yeah, no, great, great question. Uh, Anu. So, so let me, <clears throat> yeah, the power of technology is that it should assess if a child is struggling uh, on what are the prerequisite uh, knowledge that they should have mastered, right? So let's take uh, adding a quarter plus two fifths, right? So when you add one fourth plus two fifths and a child is constantly getting it wrong, um, they're probably one of two things, but they haven't understood uh, what a fraction is. And so you could actually, you know, take them down to the unit of uh, fractions and there is part of a whole, there is you know, one out of four objects uh, versus let's say one slice out of a pizza. Um, now, if the child has understood concepts and demonstrated proficiency in that, but are still struggling with one fourth plus two fifth adding, then a prerequisite knowledge on that is knowing LCM, least common multiple. So you take them to the learning unit of LCM. Now, if they are still struggling with LCM, then they need to know multiplication. So they would go to the topic of multiplication. If they struggle with that, then multiplication is repeated addition. You know, repeated addition needs addition. Addition needs you to, let's say, all the way down to subitization, which is recognizing a digit. So the software automatically ratchets down to the level of the prerequisite knowledge, all the way down to letter uh, uh, and number recognition uh, for the child. Once the child starts demonstrating uh, proficiency and mastery of that, it keeps ratcheting back up and brings them back to adding the uh, fraction. So that's how the software is designed on topics that are where you can have a prerequisite and uh, uh, the, the consequent uh, topic mapped out. Now, of course, science is a far more interdependent thing. And so you would have to sort of uh, the adaptive logic would have to be codified in a very different way. Language is another different thing, right? Where uh, you know, I actually borrowed Scarborough's <laughs> learning rope uh, to show you that at tech uh, uh, interweaving, but in language you would need exposure, you would need uh, grammar, you need so many things all built in together simultaneously happening. So each subject uh, has its own unique way of sort of learning it, uh, and who's to say we, we, we've even discovered and mastered it, but we do it to the best we can. And even every language then has its own different way, right? So when we were building for uh, Hindi, it was substantially different from English. When we were building with Tamil, it's very different from Hindi. And so we've literally had to do fundamental research on how each of those language or subject or combinations thereof are learned to, to build this up, uh, up and down, left and right. Sure, sure, yeah, just speak loud. My experiences in our MindSpark Magic Bus class where there were 40 children and we literally had some kids who were doing passages in, it was a Kannada class uh, and some kids who were not even familiar with basic vocabulary and they were so but the class because each kid had his own mind spark tablet they were able to just do it at their own pace at their own level and the you know uh, the adaptive learning showed up so beautifully in that class yeah yeah thanks thanks um so hopefully i know i've answered your question there was another question you asked me on zpd but I've forgotten that. If you could just type your question on the zone of proximal thing, Anu. Archana, uh, while we have you next. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Pranav. Uh, really enjoyed uh, your presentation, and I'm sure this could have really gone on for a longer time. Um, my specific question is with regards to the uh, external evaluations you mentioned uh, that were done. And although I'm aware that these must have had uh, different research questions and approaches, they were all measuring learning gains. Right? So um, what I was interested also, because you have a long experience, expertise as EI in large scale assessment, what I was interested in knowing is what, was, what were the differences in these uh, evaluation studies, particularly because one was uh, conducted uh, as part of the DIM and there were payments linked to the results. So were there any significant differences in the methodologies and also your experience in uh, looking at these uh, as a service provider? Right. Thanks, uh, Archana. Um, yeah, of course, uh, you know, see the, the most valuable resource is the principal investigator researcher's time, right? So they are not 
uh, going to do this unless uh, uh, it's not just about the money for them, right? It's about what research question are they yearning to answer that allows uh, an RCT to do, right? So the first RCT was literally around, uh, uh, because all the evidence on edtech until then basically pointed to um, uh, zero or negative impact on learning, right? Like one laptop per child in Peru, the Hungary experience. Uh, most experiments showed zero impact of, on learning uh, based on edtech. So when JPAL first came and saw this and sort of understood that this edtech is different because it's adaptive, it's based on pedagogy research, it's contextualized to a child's thing, and there's a lot of data iterative things that have happened, that's sort of what they were interested in. So it was a small study. It was just about a thousand students um, randomized at the student level, just four months and sort of showed it. So when that worked, they were like, okay, does this work inside a school setting? And so the second RCT that JPL does was much larger. It was three years, uh, about uh, 8,000 students, um, uh, you know, uh, baseline, midline, midline, endline. Um, and to see that uh, the first study was uh, extra time uh, on task. The second study was replacing part of the teacher's instruction. And, and that was it. The development impact bond, of course, then um, uh, uh, had a, another set of layers. One is it was in partnership. Uh, so they wanted to see how can two organizations also work together. So our field execution was done by Pratham. Um, and a lot of the software and learning was done by us. Um, in all of these cases, Arjuna, the the uh, the the money flow there was not no transaction with us. So uh, JPL raised its own funding. Even in the DIB, the funders paid it separately. And regardless of the results, the intervention organization was financially uh, um, insulated, right? So all of the money was borne by the risk investor and the outcome payers. Like the, all the interventions. Uh, were paid. So there wasn't that gaming per se, uh, uh, if if that's what you were hinting at. Um, uh, yeah, so so every every uh, uh, RCT was different. Um, uh, the, the one we did with ID Insight was actually with our private schools. So there was a set of schools that were using Asset uh, and a subset of them were using MindSpark. So we basically uh, uh, built a quasi sort of uh, uh, experimental study based on uh, uh, that. So that was more like a desk research based on past data. Um, then the one with 3IE was more qualitative in nature. So that's where they had researchers come and interview teachers and students and system. And that was not uh, quantitative in nature, but qualitative in terms of behaviors, uh, uh, willingness to adopt that tech. So each study has its own sort of research question that the PI um, researcher was interested in and um, was conducted. Does that answer your question, Archana? Yeah, thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Cool, cool. Uh, okay, so next up is Bindu. I'm so yeah. sorry to jump in, but yeah. due to our tight schedule, uh, oh, this will have to be our last question. Okay. Uh, before we move to the closed group interaction. Okay, super. So maybe someone who's not in the closed group can ask a question. I don't know who's who. Yeah, so it's okay. I'm Pranam, we have uh, five, ten, five to next 10 minutes because, you know, there's yeah. a close interaction with the MS students too. So um, if you're okay saying back to about 7, 10, then, then we can take a couple of questions. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Anil, would you like me to just take... Uh, Benita, had, yeah, Benita had asked a question, so you could take that. Uh, Bindu, would you like to ask your question? Uh, so that was uh, uh, Binita. Um, you want to you want to unmute yourself and ask? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just put it on the chat, uh, Pranav. I just it's okay. You can uh, check. It's about teachers' role. I was trying to understand teachers' role in this whole uh, mind spark. Sure. Um, probably the most important question. Um, so what is the teacher's role, right? Um, so this is how I think about the teacher's role. I, I, I think that technology should actually help teachers achieve their goal, right? And what is the teacher's goal? The teachers, I mean, out of good intent, want every child to sort of learn. Well. So let's look at, you know, what on a comparative advantage does a teacher have, right? I feel that there's one thing that teachers do that technology cannot do today, which is a human connect, right? So teachers can um, literally like, 
physically connect and, and hug and pat a child and ask them how their day was. And I think those are very important. And this was a lesson I learned uh, early in uh, uh, the 2012 13. Like I thought that, you know, oh my God, we're running such a great MindSpark Center. The students are coming because we are doing this. And so I asked a seven year old, ah, tell me, why are you center? And, and, the, and the student said, oh, here my dad is doing a lot of fun. And my brother is doing a lot of fun. And that was such a moment of reckoning because like I, I I realized that the seven year old or even a ten year old is coming because they have formed this human connect uh, with the student. Like they don't really care about what maths or literacy at that age uh, would be. So I think teachers should continue to play to inspire children to sort of you know teach them values to motivate them uh, to facilitate uh, project based learning debates you know group activities, uh, um, activity-based learning, many of those things that technology cannot do today. And what I see technology is like uh, that what teachers can delegate to, right? So the teachers can uh, leverage technology for the fact that it can give them a lot of useful analysis. They may or may not look at all of it, but it can tell them that, hey, Sarah, Pranav, and Sangeeta are the three students, you know, who haven't understood uh, uh, photosynthesis, whereas the rest of the class has. And so the teacher can make a small group and teach them that topic. Um, the technology can be, see, every child deserves a high quality coach that is available to them anytime, anywhere, but is aligned to the school teacher and the curriculum, right? So the teachers can actually activate and deactivate topics. They can restrict what the students learn in maths or language or science. Um, the software can, the software is at the control of the teacher. All of this, the teacher can decide, they can make a worksheet, they can assign homework, they can sort of um, uh, make sure that certain topics are done before others. Um, so every child deserves a coach. Uh, and that's sort of what MindSpa can be. But the coach is aligned to the teacher and reports back to the teacher. Um, of course, anytime, anywhere. And, and this is important today, right? Because you have a summer break, winter break, COVID break, political break. Uh, too hot, too cold, like, you know, we're barely netting 150 days of instruction in a school, but the biological clock is ticking for all 365 days. So so students deserve to learn anytime, anywhere. Um, you know, of course, we don't want this to be tangential to what the teacher wants to do. And finally, you know, uh, uh, at scale, right? So, so we're privileged to be in Bombay or Bangalore or uh, anywhere, but uh, how do we get this to 300 million students who go to school every day, who are growing up every day? Uh, uh, the 9 million teachers who serve them uh, are of variable quality, and we want each one of them to be able to do much better. So the role of the teacher is important to, in and in, in, in physically, you know, they're walking up and down the aisles. Uh, as you can see here, they occasionally will sit down with a child and explain them a concept. They will motivate them to come to school every day. They will um, sort of sometimes look at data and make small groups and, and teach students. So so that's what I sort of see as the you know role of teacher. Um, and, and of course, there's a whole bunch of stuff on AI, which we can talk about. But but even in AI, you know, I feel that it will help teachers to diagnose better. Right. So if you want to know where your students are, uh, technology and AI can sort of give you a far richer picture than you could have done without technology. If the teachers want the students to build a stronger foundation, uh, uh, technology can just do it far more efficiently for them, right? If teachers want their students to learn faster, they can, of course, try to sort of, you know, ride a horse. They can even become and train and become a really good jockey, but they could simply just become a race car driver, right? So the analogy here is that teachers can use technology to speed up uh, the learning because time is the scarcest resource. You know, technology is not going to do this, right? Teacher cannot say, hey, chat GPT, please ensure the entire class has learned this topic. And so teacher skills are irreplaceable, right? And they can have a very satisfying job in uh, the education sector uh, by leveraging the technology and, and making them their digital assistants to help them achieve their intent. And sort of that's how, um, you know, I see the teacher's role uh, in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the detailed response, uh, Pranav, of the teacher. Uh, I think we'll have one last question. I think uh, Vinita had already asked one. Uh, so, Vinita, you could uh, unmute yourself yeah. and ask. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Pranav. Uh, so, my question is uh, in two parts. Uh, the question is, what were uh, the shortest and the longest period of interventions 
product intervention uh, in treatment schools that were evaluated by JPAL. And uh, part D is that did you see an exponential uh, increase in learning gains as the uh, time of intervention increased? What was the second question? Did I see a exponential gain in? Exponential increase in learning gains for students as the time of intervention increased. Oh, got it, got it. Um, so, mm, very interesting. Uh, so, the I would not say exponential, but I would say linear, right? So, of course, the longer the children use it, as we saw, the more they learn. But it's not exponential, like it, so. So 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 doing sixty hours will be double than thirty hours, but it's not like it's going to be ten times more. So I think that's that. Um, what you also need to know is that uh, the more they do, then they achieve a certain threshold. So if a child is able to independently read a textbook, then they're just going to be much better, right? So exponential in terms of uh, like almost like. Uh, escaping the gravitational pull, right? Achieving escape velocity. So, so, but I can't take credit for that. Um, so, of course, we learning is lifelong. Uh, and so if you can put the child, you know, a good analogy is, does it matter if you know nine alphabets versus three alphabets? It's meaningless if you don't know all 26, right? So you want to achieve a certain threshold when you become an independent learner. So from that aspect, the longer, the better. Uh, but but it's it, there's no magic at the fifth hour versus the first hour. Yeah. So what were the shortest and the longest period period of intervention that were? Uh, yeah, four uh, months. Uh, four months versus three years. Okay. Thank you. Um. Okay. Namrata uh, experience and evolution assessments. Uh, Yes, I think the, the, the most exciting part, Namrata, on assessments is that uh, you can get far more granular details on assessments. For example, we've been assessing multiplication for 23 years, right? For the first 20 years, all we could tell you was uh, when students multiply 23 into 18, what are the challenges, uh, what percentage of the students got right. But today I can give you 12 different ways that 23 into 18 is gotten wrong by students with a frequency distribution of the mistakes they make because I built a digital grid where students type numbers and they sort of, you know, I track every movement and how much time they took and what mistakes they built. And I use then sort of uh, uh, the computational power to figure out the patterns. So now I can tell you the distinct ways in which two digit by two digit multiplication can be wrong. And uh, like they will make it confidently wrong, right? So they will do the same pattern every time and then you can build intervention. So I think that has been an amazing thing. I think on the other end of the spectrum in foundational literacy, numeracy for grades one and two, so far all assessments was done with a human being uh, doing one-on-one, -on -one, which is fine, but they were then transcribing the learning into le like levels, saying word level, pe hai, sentence level, pe hai, paragraph level, pe hai, which removes the richness of the data. So now we've built this tool where we can like, literally capture the audio track, the eye movement, the, the time between uh, letter recognitions to be able to then tell you, okay, you know, sure is a much diff different word, or e ki matra is statistically harder than u ki matra, or, or sayun takshar is much harder to learn. So I think technology has sort of helped a lot uh, on that. Um, yeah, just generative AI, I think super excited, super pumped. Uh, we've run several experiments. Uh, I had a few slides on that, but we've run out of time. But I think generative AI is going to be amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like we thought what when WhatsApp came, we thought that the government school teacher would never use a smartphone, but now everybody does it. Generative AI is going to be the same thing. There are risks to it, uh, but you can put guardrails on it. Like videos, right? On videos, you can watch porn or you can watch Khan Academy. But within Khan Academy, you will only watch educational content. So generative AI will absolutely be great. Uh, you got to put the guardrails so that there's safe use of it. You got to get over the hallucination and sort of make sure that it tells you the truth. Uh, so there are all problems with generative AI today, but I think it will uh, dramatically make a, 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 a positive dent in the education piece. There's okay. a... <laughs> Thanks, Benin. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I was finding it a little tough to jump in, but since we're out of time, um, thank you so much for that really captivating talk. I think it's got a lot of people thinking uh, about topics they probably shut out before 
uh, we'll move on to the closed group interaction for the students with the students of the masters in education and technology program thank you to both the speakers for today's talk and to the rest of the audience for joining in and asking some really thought provoking questions uh, i'll just open the breakout rooms now So Pranav, Sangeeta, and uh, others can join the breakout room along with the students. And we will have in the main room uh, a short session if there are any questions regarding MA education program. Uh, we will get the link, right? The breakout room. Maybe a prompt will come up in just yeah. a minute. So those who would like to stay for the discussion on uh, and know more about the MA program, they can stay. Otherwise, we thank everyone else. So stay connected. We will bring more uh, at Tech Talks. And there are seminars that have been lined up. So we will announce those in due course. Thank you.